With a combined 35 years of service on the Arvada City Council, today's guests have played an important role in helping our community become what it is today. Lorraine Anderson served on City Council from 1985 to 2009. In addition to her work on Council, Lorraine has served as a board member to the National League of Cities and the Regional Transit District. She's been president of the Colorado Municipal League, chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governments, and has held many other positions of public service. Mark McGough served on City Council from 2007 to 2019. Prior to his council service, Mark served the community as a board member of Ralston House, the Arvada Historical Society, the Jefferson County Historical Commission, Jefferson County Cultural Commission, the Arvada Center for the Arts and Humanities, and the Colorado Endowment for the Humanities, as well as the Governor's Council for Physical Fitness. They have kindly agreed to be here today to reflect on significant milestones and improvements to Arvada's built environment that occurred during their tenure on City Council. And they're also going to share their perspectives on service to our community. Lorraine and Mark, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. So to get started, um, I, I want to, before we start learning a little bit more about Arvada's history and, and its built environment, I wanted to uh, focus on the term built environment. When we say that, what do we mean? And why is that important to our community? Uh, to me, the built environment is everything under the ground in the city limits, on top of the ground, and in the air. So it means all the existing homes, the streets, your environment, and that's what you work with as a city council. Right. And Mark, could you share a little bit about why it's so important to invest in these in, in a general sense? Why is that important to our community? Well, first of all, in part of the um, <clears throat> built environment, of course, is residential, so uh, we're accommodating our, our citizens, our residents, and then, of course, our commercial is providing services. And then we have our transportation, and I, I like to think a lot about the uh, built environment of our parks and trails, which enhance the experience of living within our uh, community. So without the built environment of residential, commercial, aesthetic, et cetera, we just really don't have a community. So to my mind, that's what makes it really important to be very careful and thoughtful about the built environment. Excellent. So let's dig into it a little bit. We're going to cover a lot of different areas across the city and, and look at some of those decisions and ways the community has collaborated. And I thought it might be fun to start with um, Westwood's golf course. And Lorraine, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what, what Westwoods was like when you first joined council and kind of how that's evolved over time. Well, Westwoods was farm ground at that time. And it was representative of the farming community that we had. The farms in Arvada were small farms. They, 160 acres was a large farm for Arvada. Most of them were much smaller. And as the economy and farm markets changed, you saw people wanting to sell some of those farms to perhaps invest in a farm, in a larger farm, where they could make more. Could either of you maybe share a little bit about the, the new Westwoods and kind of the, the work that went into creating a new facility there and more of a formal golf course? You know, the, the golf course was planned but it was not planned in isolation with the homes to come later. There was a vision for that entire area with the homes and that they would be especially nice homes and they became part of the parade of homes. They became a, 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 became a showcase of homes. So I think that was important that it was seen as a much larger entity than just the golf course. And of course, over time, it, the whole area has filled in with residences and commercial close by. And the golf course itself has become very, very popular. And it's become not only a golf course, but a, a meeting place for the neighborhood and a, a significant and very fine restaurant. And so it was necessary just a few years ago, two or three years ago, that the uh, clubhouse was expanded to be about twice as large as it had been and to have uh, the outside, outdoor, the deck, and just made it a much, much nicer uh, clubhouse, a place for golfers and for the neighbors. 
Wonderful, yes, an award-winning uh, clubhouse and yeah, wonderful absolutely. experience over there. And I have a feeling that we'll, as we look at some other examples, you kind of describe a, a bit of a, a, a orca, orchestra, conducting an orchestra or a complex project of how the different considerations in our community fit together within the built environment. Um, one of the most important uh, priorities for our community is obviously public safety. And Mark, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the police departments, or, or start us off with the discussion about the police departments um, move to sector policing and the growth and the planning and the development and building of um, sub community substations to support that approach. What that means for the uh, community and kind of how that worked. And, and if you both want to jump in, that's that's great. Okay. Well, the. The problem became uh, in recent years that the, the community has expanded. From east to west, it's uh, 15 miles or so, and um, it, the population has increased significantly. And so um, there was a, a need for additional police and uh, public safety resources, but where to place them? And so I guess one alternative might have been to expand the city hall or the city hall complex to accommodate all the police resources. But if that were to happen, we would still have the problem with distance and uh, providing services to the outlying parts of the city. So the, the master plan became to add three substations within the city, which puts the police resources close to the various communities. So we have one in the Lake Arbor area in the northeast portion of the city, one at Whisper Creek, which is kind of almost uh, to the west, but in the north side, and then the third one in the Westwoods area, so that when there's police services needed, the police officers have shorter distances, they can interact much more easily with the uh, community, and it saved, rather than having one large central place for police services, now we have actually four because we have the, the main office for the police department at City Hall and then the three substations. So it's allowed us to provide better services more quickly within the city. I'd like to add that it is probably an outgrowth of the Arvada Police Department's dedication to community policing and putting the police officers in the community so that they know and know the people that live there and are available to help solve uh, community issues, which um, in the past when neighborhoods start to change, uh, older people move out, younger people move in, um, many times there are conflicts, and I can remember the police department working with things like that as uh, a community policing agency. You know, as you know, the city is really focused on community engagement in an ever-increasing way, and, and we really look to the police department to help lead that, but also they, they led the movement years ago, just as you say. And, and so a wonderful approach to our public safety. Um, <clears throat> Mark, you mentioned uh, earlier about the parks and trails and open space and, and some of the decisions that have been made to support those um, those amenities in our community. In fact, I think you've, you've mentioned before that uh, our parks and trails were one of the reasons why you came to our community in the first place. So I was wondering if you could kick off a, a brief discussion of the importance of those and, and some of the decisions or examples of, of collaboration that's happened in the community to support our parks, trails, and open space? Well, I think the most important thing is to go back to the very early 70s when a, um, a ballot initiative was presented to the voters and voters approved uh, by ballot issue the funding of a, a comprehensive parks and trails system. So that's what was truly the beginning of having a system. Although we had a couple of parks before that, now we had the opportunity for a parks and trails system. And since then, we have developed parks in all of the new neighborhoods that have been created, and that's part of the development process, so part of the what we require of the built environment when a new housing development goes in, that there be parks uh, available. And we've had also, through a comprehensive plan for our parks, 
We've also established new parks in some of our older neighborhoods, and now we've connected a lot of them with the trails within the city. So when you really take a look at it, it's almost a 50-year project to develop the parks and trails system. And we have a program called Taking Lasting Care for our parks program so that the parks are funded as they come online and we know that we have dedicated funds for the maintenance of the parks, replacement of parks uh, amenities as necessary. So there truly is a, a, has been a plan which started with the vote in the early 70s and continues to today and looks 10 years into the future for the maintenance of our system. We have been so fortunate in that we've had the opportunity to save some of our larger farms uh, in Arvada and to use that for open space and trails. All of our ball fields are on former farm grounds and it's been an interesting um, experience to work with people developing parks and it has not always been easy. Um, there was one park that people didn't want developed or the neighbors didn't and uh, that was a difficult part and um, I, I remember Shelley Cook um, chairing those meetings that were quite difficult um, and trying to keep the peace. Um, one of the um, more interesting developments was two ponds and the two ponds issue. And quite frankly, it turned into just a great area for wildlife and for teaching kids. But one of the things that happened there that nobody really focuses on is that the whole two ponds issue uh, was related to Colorado's open meetings law. And it was the first time that, uh, that the open meetings law was uh, used in the state of Colorado. So people forget that part of the story, but it's very important in that our citizens are um, should be notified of actions that city council takes. And so I, I thought that was sort of a landmark in Arvada in making sure that uh, city council's uh, meetings are held in public. Yes, and it, it also, is, I think, speaks, as we, we will see perhaps uh, later on, that some of the things that we love most in our community took a lot of hard work and uh, to have come about, and uh, not always easy conversations to have. So thank you for sharing that. Um, one of the things, obviously, that's very relevant right now uh, is growth and development, and I wanted to take a moment to um, hear some of your thoughts on how the city has expanded out west. Some of our more recent growth in terms of housing has been to the west in places like Candelas and Leiden Rock and Leiden Ranch. I was wondering if you could talk about those projects um, and, and your perspectives on working together uh, with the community and or, or wherever you want to take it about some of the decisions that were made to um, grow into the West. Well, Candelas, for example, is one that uh, Lorraine and I shared because the first approval of that came of the outline development plan, I recall, was in March of 2008 while we were serving together on the council. And what's important with these very large developments is that they have not grown in a haphazard way. There has been what I referred to as an outline development, kind of an overall look at what are we going to have here over a period of time. So what the developers, together with the very professional city staff, have developed a comprehensive look at those areas before it's brought to the city council. And then with the discussions through the city council, sometimes there's refinement, there are questions asked, and of course there's been meetings with neighborhoods before that. And so when we, when we uh, finally approve something, 
we pretty well know what it is that we're going to be having. And even as, for example, with Candelas, since it was first developed in its current iteration, the outline development plan was 2008, although many of the plans go back many years before that, but it still has needed to be tweaked and changed over the last dozen years as things have unfolded. They didn't unfold just the way we thought they might, and so there's been the opportunity to update, to change, to improve, and that has happened with these large developments, Whisper Creek, Leiden Ranch, Leiden Rock. That's what's very important when we think about built environment, to think through ahead of time, what is that built environment going to be? And I think our city staff and our city council, our planning commission have done an outstanding job of that over the years to make sure that we're going to get what we think we're going to get. And be flexible uh, enough to adjust as we move forward. Adjust, like with anything, looking 10 or 12 years into the future, mm -hmm. things do change. We, we can't go on just a, a steady, a straightforward line. One of the interesting things that's happening uh, where I live, which is uh, close to the Old Town area, is the changes uh, happening uh, and the issues uh, by, that are created by infill projects and how we um, change our older neighborhoods. And I think there, there was just recently, and I think Mark was on council when it passed, the Reno neighborhood um, made some changes to their um, design guidelines, I think uh, is what they called them, and how infill projects can be done in that neighborhood without destroying uh, perhaps the historical significance of the whole area. And that, has, that is still ongoing in the Arvada area. One of the easier things in the grand scheme is the approval of a brand new project where there hasn't been anything before. One of the most difficult is to deal with what Lorraine referred to as the infill projects to say where there's been vacant property with houses around and now somebody proposes something new and different, uh, those become very contentious and again that's one of those very important things where it's a, a thoughtful process through the neighborhood meetings, through the planning commission, the public hearings before the planning commission and the council to see if we can get it right. And of course, most of these aren't without some contention uh, because it's a change to the existing environment. Well, I, I wanna turn a little bit to um, the commercial side because um, we have people that live here and they need things and they need to have uh, experiences in our community. And so um, I wanted to get your thoughts on how um, the built environment has changed over your time on city council to support our local economy and provide people with services in our community. Just talk a little bit about commercial uh, built environment in our, in our city. That's a, a great uh, opportunity to talk about um, how it was when I went on city council. It was the beginning of urban renewal and prior councils were concerned that Arvada would become a community without any jobs, without any commercial development, without any services that their citizens need. And so they put into place the urban renewal authority and also had a sales tax increase at that time with a penny dedicated to our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So what has happened through the years is that I think we haven't had any huge shopping centers or anything, but I think the city councils through the years have done their best to bring commercial services, groceries, clothing, things people need, and to also provide areas for jobs and job growth. And for a small city, I think we've done a fair job in that. 
and it continues with, I think, the Candelas area and still some renewal projects in southeast Arvada are certainly uh, something that can be done. Mark, are there any projects that come to mind, um, collaborations with city council and the community to redevelop areas uh, to support com new commercial activity that you want to speak about? Yeah, one of them that might be mentioned is that uh, out in the Candelas area at 86th and uh, Indiana on that northwest corner where there has uh, been a demand as the new homes have gone in there, demand for services, a request for services. The city council has worked with uh, businesses, not just the city council, I really should say city staff has worked with a variety of businesses to see what we can do to develop that area. One of the most significant was on the council a few years ago where we collaborated with King Supers to uh, build a very large store at that corner, which was the jump start of a commercial area there where now we have some restaurants, some professional offices, uh, some uh, repair services, et cetera, uh, in that area. So that was a deliberate kind of choice, if you will, or a deliberate move to get them there. It was not just wait until they might come. It was, let's get this uh, working together. So we worked with uh, the developer and we worked with the corporations to make sure that we got a business that's there. Uh, that has happened too in the Whisper Creek uh, uh, neighborhood, the development uh, in that same area of the city where there are smaller service uh, uh, businesses uh, to provide uh, services for that uh, community. But that has happened throughout our community. Lorraine mentioned uh, the, the urban renewal projects along I-70 and Wadsworth and that whole area. That was all a deliberate plan where th there was cooperation between the city and corporations to bring in certain types of businesses. And Westwoods, the same way. Uh, so uh, basically all of these commercial areas have been uh, developed, uh, many with the, at the insistence of the neighbors wanting certain services and others just uh, having a master plan or having a plan for a given area. So. Excellent. Well, <clears throat> obviously we have people living in our community and we have businesses in our community, but we need to connect the two and get, keep it all connected. And, um, and infrastructure comes to mind. The importance of, of infrastructure is that bedrock that um, supports everything else. I was hoping you could uh, each speak to some of the bigger infrastructure projects, uh, transportation, water utilities, accomplishments over your tenure in city council. Um, and, and talk a little bit about the importance of infrastructure in our community. Lorraine? Well, I think um, it's interesting how Old Town has changed since I went on city council. Old Town had businesses just fading away when I was first elected, and I was offered a seat on the Forward Arvada Building Corporation, which basically was uh, several uh, business owners down in Old Town, and they um, they served uh, as a conduit for small business loans. But they also had a goal redeveloping Old Town. And I know that I've spent hours with people, other council members, and others in the area, other businesses, and how we could bring people to Old Town and business to Old Town. And part of that was, gee, we've got railroad tracks here, maybe we could run a train up and down and, and bring people from Denver out here to our little Wild West town, basically, so different from Denver. Mm -hmm. And that was just a long process. City Council was uh, cooperative in changing zoning so we could get density down there, which actually put us in place in the whole United States to compete for 
a grant from the Federal Transit Administration to build the G line. So it was done with the federal grant, and that's been a huge project that made some real change to an old town that was dying when I started on city council. I'd like to mention some things about our, our streets, too. I mean, if you go back a few years, we had fairly good uh, transportation north and south with Sheridan Boulevard, Wadsworth Boulevard, and Kipling, which went about halfway through the, the city. But at least there were, you know, the north-south uh, travel. But east-west was truly uh, difficult. 72nd Avenue was uh, built, I don't know, 15 years or something ago when that was um, completed. 86th Parkway, which gets people from Wadsworth over to Highway 93 and, of course, connects with the highways beyond that. The Ralston Road has been improved greatly over the years, and there's still a project currently in place to widen areas of Ralston Road, which should provide easier transportation for folks. And then, of course, 72nd Avenue is a big project approved by the voters a couple of years ago, which will allow the, uh, the widening of um, 72nd Avenue, where the portion that was built before was between Wadsworth and Kipling. Now it's going to be extended from Kipling to Sims with an underpass under the a grade separation with the railroad at Oak Street and 72nd. And that's crucially important, not only for ease of transportation to get people through there when the train is going by, so they don't have to stop and wait for the train, but also for public safety services, for police and fire response not being hung up at that area also. So over time, in terms of getting people to our commercial, connecting residential and commercial, our roadways become truly important, and those east-west arterial streets now are just, we're getting close to getting those finished. Not there yet, but uh, being thankful to the voters for approving those projects, we're getting close on those, and that's truly important, not only for today, but for the future of Arvada. It, um, it has never been easy to make changes in Arvada, and um, I think I was at every public meeting on 72nd, and so people in, in our town feel very strongly um, about, um, about their homes and what, what happens to their community. And so it's not easy to change the built environment and Fortunately, we have a 72nd that functions quite well, and we have Ralston Road that uh, does. And I think just to mention a little bit about Ralston Road, because Ralston Road had houses on both sides, and how we could uh, change that to make it handle the traffic that was wanting to go east to Sheridan was quite a process. And finally the folks said, if you separate us from the roadway, we'll, uh, we'll like that. And so I always like to take um, fellow council members from other cities down Ralston Road to show what a nice neighborhood uh, is really to the south of Ralston Road from when I first moved to Arvada. So those are good things, and but it takes a long public process. Well, <clears throat> working with the public and, and city staff and city council, it strikes me that everyone has to work together to sort of predict the future and figure out how to be prepared for what's coming. And so I wanted to put you on the spot a little bit after reflecting on 35 years of, of work on, on city council. What do you see as, um, some things that, in terms of the built environment, that we need to be prepared for in the coming years, uh, in the future. Well, I believe we're going to always see change, and nobody likes change, but change will happen. Um, our growth rate is small. Um, 
back, you know, uh, we all have had children. Some of them have stayed here. Some of them have moved to other cities. But uh, we have to always plan ahead for who will come after us. Mark? As I look ahead, I think we're going to see some... We're going to see larger buildings, residential buildings, for example. Uh, I think that's just uh, what people are wanting these days. I think we'll see taller buildings in some parts of our cities. I think uh, of our city, and I think we'll see a redevelopment of our shopping centers as the shopping habits of people change. I think that there's going to be change within those shopping centers, perhaps to incorporate uh, residential, perhaps to incorporate other services that are not traditional in our uh, shopping centers. I think we're going to see additional um, ex um, ADUs, uh, the accessory dwelling units, where small um, homes may be uh, built in the backyard of a, of a, of a residence to accommodate um, a single person, for example. I think we'll see small uh, homes themselves. There's been one recently, uh, I don't remember now if it's been finally approved, but a development that will be of small homes that will be individual homes, but still like between 500 and 800 square feet. I think we'll see those kinds of things. And part of that is because our population is changing. You know, we're becoming an older community, just as Jefferson County is becoming an older, uh, popul uh, the population is becoming older in Jefferson County, I think we'll make accommodations for them. So I see those kinds of specific changes coming over, over time, which will represent challenges for the public policy process and the approval process for things. But at least these will be requ requested. And I'll add one more that comes to mind. We haven't experienced very many what we call uh, pop tops, uh, the pop up homes where a second story has built, been built onto a home. But I suspect we will be dealing with that challenge in, in years ahead where we've got a lot of older homes which might accommodate different living arrangements if they were enlarged in that way. So I think those will be challenges for the city in the future. I, I would like to just uh, mention that Arvada was a leader in accessory dwelling units. Um, it, it was an idea that came about, and as we look to densify different areas in our city, I think Arvada was one of the first cities to pass an ordinance that allowed those. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, uh, just because I have you, I'm going to ask you to switch up gears a little bit and just reflect a little bit on your time on city council generally. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on your feelings about public service and the time you spent on council, perhaps uh, an accomplishment or two that you're particularly proud of. Lorraine, could you start? Well, um, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a mixed uh, bag. I think 72nd was one of the things I've accomplished that I was proud of, mainly because people that supported me when I was elected came up to me and said, you need to build 72nd. And I also am uh, quite proud of the fact that we brought the G line to Arvada and that it, it competed nationwide with other rail lines. And the reason we were able to acquire that is because our city council recognized the need to densify our uh, older areas of the city. And that was not easy. So um, I think um, I think our city councils here uh, have always worked toward a better Arvada, and um, I've, it's been my pleasure to serve with all the different people that I have on city council through the years. Thank you. Mark? 
For me, I would just say it's been um, it was challenging all the time, uh, with the particularly when dealing with the built environment. And just to add a, a comment about the built environment, there are many decisions on the city council which are pretty easy. Proclamations, <laughs> recognitions, uh, those kinds of things. But when you deal with the built environment, you're dealing with something that's going to last basically forever. The decisions you make are going to last into the foreseeable future. Building a street, approving a, a major uh, building, whatever, those last forever. So those are the challenging experiences on the, uh, on the council. But it was enjoyable. The thing that, they, there are two areas that I think I would take particular pride in. One is the, the sector policing and the community police stations. The other would be the creation of new parks and adding to the system of parks and trails in Arvada. Uh, those I take particular satisfaction in. Wonderful. Well, I want to just finish up by thanking you for your leadership in our community and for your dedicated public service over more than 35 years, but uh, 35 years on council combined. So I uh, really appreciate you being here and sharing your views on our built environment and for uh, your, your service to our community. Well, this concludes today's discussion. I'd like to again thank Lorraine Anderson and Mark McGough for sharing their perspectives on important changes to our city over the past decades and for their dedicated public service to our community. To learn more about the City of Arvada's programs and projects and the latest opportunities to get involved, visit arvada.org, follow us on social media, and check out the latest engagement opportunities on Speak Up Arvada. And remember that you can watch live City Council meetings and other programming on Arvada's Channel 8 and recorded meetings and additional videos on the City's YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.